Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Be Curious Late's event, Cotton's Hidden Voices. A live transcript is available for this event, and the link will be provided in the chat now. And you can click this to follow along with us. Um, my name is Dr. Bethan Bide, and I will be your host for tonight. I'm a fashion researcher in the School of Design at the University of Leeds, and I've got a particular interest in the processes by which clothes are made and what this means for consumers. In each late event, we invite you to take a peek at what goes on inside a university with help from University of Leeds researchers and partners they work with. And our speakers are always connected by a theme. And the theme for tonight's event is the second in the series of late, it's all all about the cotton industry. We'll be exploring some of the common sustainability challenges we hear about the fashion industry and examining the importance of cotton for farmers and their families with insights from workers in the global supply chain. And each speaker will give you their take on the theme. After that, we'll be inviting questions from you. So if you have a question for one of our speakers, just post it in the chat, which you should see to the right of your screen if you're viewing the event in YouTube. To participate in the live chat, you'll be required to sign into YouTube using a Google account. If you'd rather not log in and you're happy just to watch along, that is absolutely fine too. Our moderator team will be keeping an eye on the chat and would love to say hello to some of you this evening. So let's give that a try now. If you wanna give us a big hello and let us know where you're tuning in from in the world using the chat, we would love to hear from you. Uh, hello everyone, it's great to see you here. Um, okay, so without further ado, let's get on with tonight's speakers. So tonight's speakers are Mark Sumner, Alia Malik, and Alan Williams. And we're going to kick off tonight by turning to Mark Sumner. So Mark, I'm gonna hand over to you now. Hi, Bethan. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk tonight. So my name's uh, Dr. Mark Sumner. Um, I'm a lecturer at the School of Design at the University of Leeds. And one of the research areas that I'm focusing on is uh, sustainable fashion. And as cotton is such an important part of the fashion industry, it plays a really important part in, in my research. And cotton is a, is a, is a really interesting fibre that we, that we use every day. All of us will be wearing cotton in one form or another in, in regards to you know, whether we're wearing a T-shirt, um, whether wearing uh, you know, denim jeans, um, most of our underwear is most likely to be made out of cotton. So cotton has a very intimate connection with, with all of us. And cotton's link uh, with, with humans can be traced back over 7,000 years. There is evidence to suggest that, that cotton was used um, for, for clothing um, almost uh, 7,000 years ago. It's a plant that is now cultivated globally and we know cotton in many different names, um, but one name that really sticks out for me in terms of giving an historic feel for, for cotton and where it's come from is Barnwell, uh, which is the, the German uh, name for cotton, which actually means um, tree cotton, uh, sorry, tree wool. Um, and the reason that the, the Germans, and in fact, most of Northern Europeans uh, talked about um, cotton being tree wool is they'd never really seen where cotton had, had, was grown. And they thought it was some sort of form of, of, of wool that grew on a bush. Cotton is by far the most popular of, of the fibres that we use within the industry. And the cotton uh, form uh, is, is really, uh, it comes from this idea of, of the cotton seed having all of these uh, fibres on its surface. So there's something like half a million fibres on the surface of, of the uh, uh, cotton seed. And cotton has evolved to have all of these fibres there because what it wanted to do was to use those fibres to, to catch with the, get, be caught by the wind and to blow those, those seeds around to actually spread the cotton plant uh, further and further afield. But of course, we now use those fibres for textiles and for making the clothes that we wear. And cotton is an amazing fibre. It's a very complex fibre. Um, what you can see on the screen there is, is a cross section of that fibre in terms of the different uh, um, uh, walls and, and different components of that fibre. And what you can also see is it has a very complex shape. In terms of its cross section, it has this sort of kidney shape with a hollow centre. 
and its length is quite convoluted and twisted. And it's this structure that makes cotton unique. The, uh, the, the kidney shape and that long convoluted shape um, makes cotton warm to wear and also makes it soft on our skin. And the structure, which is made up of nearly 90% cellulose, means that cotton actually absorbs water and water vapor, making it breathable and also very comfortable to wear. So we can see that cotton, in, in terms of that complex structure, is really um, um, very nicely aligned to the physiology that humans have in terms of what we want from clothing, this idea of something that's soft and comfortable and breathable. And because cotton has, over the years, become an essential part of uh, the textile industry, an essential part of, of all of our lives in terms of the clothes that we wear. We can now see that cotton is grown in many different parts of the world. And in fact, cotton is grown in over 80 different countries across the world. And these countries are very diverse in terms of uh, their background, and, but they are all linked by the fact that they produce cotton. So we're talking about countries as diverse as the United States, uh, China, India, Mali in Africa, and also Brazil. Unfortunately, we don't grow cotton in the UK. Um, apparently, it's too wet and cold in the UK for cotton. Um, some of you may appreciate that if you live over here. Um, but it's big business. Cotton is a really big business. Uh, there's something like 25 million tonnes of cotton are grown every year. And that cotton crop is worth billions of dollars. And retailers, brands, and their global supply chains are heavily reliant on a secure, steady supply of cotton to make that industry work. But because we're so reliant uh, on production of cotton, because the cotton um, process, uh, the agricultural process, is a very intensive agricultural process, cotton is actually um, considered to have some very harmful impacts in terms of the environment. Now, this chart looks slightly complicated, but essentially what this chart is telling us is the bigger the bar, the bigger the impacts um, on the environment in terms of global warming, in terms of uh, things like freshwater pollution, in terms of uh, eutrophication, and in terms of toxicological impacts. And what you can see on the chart is the biggest bar by far is cotton. So this means when we look at the science behind the, the cultivation of cotton in this very intensive agricultural system, means that cotton has a very significant impact on the environment. And many people will be surprised that actually the impact of cotton on the environment is substantially bigger than the impact of man-made fibres like uh, polyester or viscose. But it's important to remember that that impact of cotton, although cotton is a natural fibre, is based on the way that we currently grow cotton. It's not only the environmental impacts that we need to worry about when we're thinking about cotton. Cotton historically has many um, social or ethical issues associated with it. Again, about the way that we grow the cotton, the way that we treat the farmers. So for example, you can see on the screen, uh, the classic example of um, an American white farmer and um, the uh, slaves that are working on his farm to um, pick the grow the cotton and pick the cotton and make money for that farmer. But that historic link in terms of slavery and cotton is a real life link that's going on now. There are examples of slavery. There are examples of um, poor ethical approaches going on in some cotton fields around the world. And although I have, I, it's important to, to recognize here that um, agriculture across the world, whether it's cotton, whether it's wheat, whether it's um, maize, in that intensive system has issues around environmental impacts and also has uh, instances and challenges around ethics and um, issues associated with things like modern slavery. So cotton has these, these issues associated with it in terms of its environmental impact and also some of those social impacts that are, that are associated with, with agriculture, um, uh, particularly in uh, the global south. So there's a very strong charge now within the industry and within the scientific community to try and find alternatives to cotton. 
to try and work out how we can replace cotton as a plant, as a fibre for the textile industry. Some of these um, uh, uh, we, we may know really quite well, but not really know where they've come from. So, for example, in the middle of the screen, you can see uh, a eucalyptus uh, plantation. Uh, so eucalyptus is very, uh, um, has a very uh, intensive um, structure made up of lots of cellulose. And that cellulose, using a very intensive chemical and um, energy intensive process, can be extracted to you and, and, and that cellulose can be then used to be making um, fibres such as viscose. There's also been a lot of talk about the use of bamboo as a replacement to cotton. But again, that bamboo has to go through a very intensive process of, of uh, using energy and chemicals to convert the cellulose within the bamboo to create uh, a fibre. And we've seen some new technology that's being developed based on um, uh, mycenum, which is, which is using essentially mushrooms to almost grow fabrics to uh, provide an alternative to cotton. But one of the things that is really challenging about this approach and this idea about cotton and its sustainability is in many ways it's a very Western centric view. It's a view about sustainability that is driven by our sort of northern European, northern uh, global north uh, um, view of, of what cotton can actually do and, and some of the, the impacts associated with it. One of the things that we notice in terms of some of the research and some of the approaches to um, cotton and the development of some of these alternatives is it really forgets the fact that cotton provides a very um, interesting and important source of income and livelihood for 120 million farmers across the world. Farmers in places like Mali, places like India and, and, and Brazil, not to mention farmers in developed nations such as um, uh, the USA and Australia. So we have this real challenge now of trying to understand how we explore the sustainability of cotton which, as I say, is unique in terms of its structure, unique in its way of um, providing us with clothing, but has some challenging aspects in, ter in terms of its sustainability. And what we need to be thinking about in, in our Western perspective is recognising how we balance up our need for an environmentally and socially uh, uh, sustainable product and balancing that up with the needs of um, the farmers and communities who are heavily reliant on cotton as providing a source of income and a route out of poverty. So thank you, Bethan. Um, thank you, Mark. That was fascinating. Um, we've got lots of engagement here. So I'm going to kick off with um, a question that's raised by a couple of people who are kind of expressing surprise about the scale of cotton's impact um, and talking about the fact that the high street often sells cotton as a kind of eco alternative. So I kind of wonder, do you have any thoughts about now, why consumers, as consumers, were often quite unaware of the impact of cotton? Yeah, I think one of the big challenges when we talk about sustainability is there is a uh, natural assumption that because something is natural, then it's good for the planet. And in many cases, that is obviously true. You know, um, you know having a, a natural ecosystem, uh, all of these things are interlinked. But I was very specific when I was talking about cotton in terms of its challenges. It's, it's, it's related to the way that we actually grow cotton. So it's not cotton per se that, that the issue, that, that's the issue. It's actually the need to, to create as much cotton as we, as we want um, to, to feed the, the, the fashion industry. So the way that we grow cotton is the challenge. And I guess in, in, in many, uh, for many people, understanding those agricultural systems, whether it's for cotton, whether it's for the food that we eat, or whether it's for other crops, we don't get true visibility of all of those in interconnections. For example, you know, the fertilizers and the pesticides that are used on the food and, and uh, that we eat or, or, or the, the, the cotton that is grown to, to, to make our clothes, we have a lack of visibility of those sort of things. So it's not surprising that um, you know, many people don't really fully appreciate some of the challenges that we, we face in terms of um, cotton production. Yeah, um, we've, we've got a lot of interest in the graph that you showed as well about impacts. Um, and 
Uh, so a sort of one of the questions we've got about that uh, asks, the impact of cotton was very striking um, compared to other fibres such as tensile. Uh, does that graph allow for the quantities of each fibre used? So to what that graph tries to, tries to do, and I, and I, and I, I am denied about including that graph because it's, very, it's, it's quite a difficult one to work our way through. But what, what that graph tries to do is to say, um, or the, what the research tried to do is to, is to compare a kilo of cotton to a kilo of tensile to a kilo of, of polyester and look at the production processes that um, were needed to create that kilo of fibre ready to then be used to make clothing so we, we, that that, that um, it's a life cycle assessment um, it, it's it's a relatively old one but it's one that actually has been uh, has been looked at a lot um, and it allows us to make that direct comparison the thing that it doesn't do um, is talk about what happens to the fiber as it goes through the process and what happens at end of life um, and uh, you know looking at those LTAs there's all sorts of interesting things that come out of that but uh, that's probably for another day I think because that's quite a complex sort of uh, set of processes to have a look at. Yeah so I've got one final question before we move on to our next speaker um, which is about uh, the alternatives that you mentioned like eucalyptus or bamboo. Um, do you think they could ever be used to produce the same scale as cotton um, or in similar countries as cotton production is now? It's a good question. Um, I, I really don't know the answer to, to uh, the scale that these these um, these materials can, can actually get to. Will they ever achieve the same scale as, as cotton? Um, one of the things I am aware of, though, is that um, there are limitations on where in the world that the, these these fibers can be grown, um, or these crops can be grown. So it could be quite challenging that if we were to shift everything to, let's say, eucalyptus or, or wood-based uh, fibers such as viscose, um, there are certain parts of of the world where cotton is currently grown where those types of plants wouldn't be grown. The other interesting thing about this as well, though, is the cotton plant cotton production is an annual thing. So you plant the seed and within six to nine months, you're, you're harvesting in that, uh, that, the, the, the cotton and you have the opportunity to get a return on your investment. Production of trees and growing of trees takes a long time. So there's a real challenge in terms of that transition as well. Um, and in fact, I was reading recently that there are certain parts of, 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 um, uh, of India uh, and certain parts of the world where they have banned uh, the, the, the growth of, of things like eucalyptus because it has such a significant impact on the, 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 the local ecosystem. You know, it challenges, you know, what's going on there. So, you know, the water uh, consumption that's associated with that, things like biodiversity are affected. So it's not a question, again, it's not a question of a Western view of, you know, what's the alternative. It's about understanding what it means for the local communities and for the farmers themselves as well. Um, thank you so much, Mark. That was absolutely fascinating. So we're going to move on now to our second speaker this evening, who is Alia Malik. So I'm going to kind of call Alia up to the screen. Hi, hi, good evening. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, supply chains and cotton farms. So I work at the Better Cotton Initiative. Um, and uh, basically what we do is we're working to help cotton communities survive and thrive while protecting and restoring the environment. So you can look at um, the footprint of cotton from many different perspectives. And I think that that slide that Mark showed is quite interesting. And um, uh, it, at the moment, the way that the original LCA methodologies were developed um, uh, synthetic and plastic looks great um, and natural fibers don't look so good um, but there are plenty of ways to look at the data and I think the updated methodology will show a slightly different picture but um, one of the things that Mark mentioned that um, speaks to what the mission of better cotton is is around those um, hundreds of millions of people whose lives and livelihoods depend on cotton um, for sustenance and cotton is a really interesting crop um, in the suite of agriculture um, because you know it's not food 
well, for the most part, you can do some things with the seed, but it's it's not food. It's mainly for for income. It's for um, it's for cash um, into the mix of a farm uh, economy, and um, there are a lot of problems in cotton production, um, partially because of that. So because people are not eating cotton and it, they're depending on it for their livelihood, there <clears throat> is a lot of um, overuse of chemical and synthetic fertilizer. Um, there are plenty of farmers of cotton that aren't necessarily using uh, good quality seed, um, best practice methodologies. And so there's a huge scope, huge scope to make cotton production at the farm level much more sustainable. Um, and so that's what we work on. <clears throat> and um, our standard system um, brings together lots of farmers from around the world. Actually, our, the updated, we, we work in 25 countries around the world and we're producing about 25% of global cotton production under our licensing arrangements. But the idea is we're working with uh, many farmers all around to help improve uh, farming practices. Um, and our, for our 2030 strategy, we have five targets. One is around climate change mitigation, around soil health, pesticide use, smallhold livelihoods, women's empowerment. So, you know, looking at these uh, two, these indicators represent uh, a broad scope of what we do, but it doesn't represent all the things we do. So <clears throat> you can, a lot of standard systems might work on just the environment or just on the labor practices or just on the economics, like does it, does it work for the farmer? We're trying to bring all those things together. Um, and um, one of the things that we see is that there's, a, with this huge opportunity that there's available for improvement, um, it's really about um, support. It's about making sure that um, remote communities in uh, Mozambique or in Maharashtra in India have access to um, information about how to grow more sustainably. And more sustainably um, can also be just more efficiently. And, um, I'll show you a quick video of um, what this looks like for a farmer. And I'm not sure if it'll play in this format, but I'm going to pull it up from a link. Namaskar Setkari Bandunu, Misha Bridge Agan Vadavimi, Magil Teen, Varsha Pasun, Bishi, Lupincha Setkari, Ahevo, Maji Seti Teen, Eker, Korodo Shetra Ahe, Vomi Yavarshid. वर्षी दोन एकर मध्य बिशियाई चा पद्धति ने कापुस पिकाची सेती करते मी बीज प्रक्रिया करून एक बीज लागवन के लिया ने माजा खर्च कमी पन्ना स्टक कमी झाला है वो मी कापुस पिका मध्य अंतर पीक मनुन मुग आनी तुर इतर सेत करियाना पान्या चा साटा उपलब्ध होइल आनी सेत करियाना सेतात गांडूर खताचा आणि निम अर्क दशपर्ण अर्क फवरनी साठी वापरावे जन करून आपल्या जमीनीचा आरोग्य चांगले राहील व माला बीसीआई लुपिनचा मोलाचा मार्गदर्शन मिळाला आणि मी आता सुधर ते पद्धतीने शेती करते धन्यवाद um, so i mean one of the missing pieces when you look at different data snapshots is people um, what does it mean for people? What does it mean for people? There are, like in the fashion industry, there's a lot of interest to be more sustainable. People have in their KPIs now to also um, make social and environmental progress, make progress on issues for women. And um, it looks super convenient to say, well, let's try to move away from cotton because <clears throat> that could be a risk area, you know, that we can't control how it's practiced on the ground or that um, we don't know um, what journey it takes to the market. Um, and you know, that that's, that's fair enough. But it does also neglect that, um, as Mark mentioned, if you um, move away from cotton, you're also moving away from one of the uh, channels for livelihoods for many, many people. Um, and cotton can be grown sustainably, um, you know, both in the smallholder and in the you know, efficient agriculture in the large farms in the US and Australia. Um, there's so much you can do to reduce the water footprint, to um, bring in practices that let farmers be stewards of the land. There is a huge amount of land around the world that's being cultivated with cotton. And the opportunity is really in um, uplifting the practice, you know, because it's connected to the industry in this way. And there's a lot of will and interest in it becoming more sustainable. Um, and so Better Cotton, you know, we've had some challenges recently around um, the lack of 
traceability and transparency in the cotton supply chain. Um, that, you know, the challenges of, you know, different places that have different labor practices and, you know, decent work violations and not being able to know where the cotton comes from or what the footprint or what the buying, you buy that t-shirt and what does it mean for a person? Um, and there's this huge momentum now from consumers, but also from regulation and from investors and for the businesses in general to um, uh, move towards having transparency. And, you know, we've been doing some work to figure out whether we should work on this because our mission is really around farm level production and trying to make it better. Um, and it seemed like it's just too important at the moment to everyone and to Cotton's future. Um, and so far, we've been using something called mass balance. This is really technical. And it's basically that um, for the um, investment that people make in better cotton, so the retailers and brands buy a certain amount through us, and they give money, and we direct that money to do farmer support, um, training, and um, you know, having people that they can talk to and get information from. Um, we've been using mass balance. So the cotton is produced by licensed growers. We kind of know how much is produced. And then at the end of the day, we know how much the retailers and the brands have bought. And in between, we're not tracking it. Um, so all of the traceability is gone. Um, and it works really well because it means we don't spend um, our resources on that. We're spending it on the farm. However, it misses this huge problem that actually today people really need to know where things are from. And so, you know, we've started working on developing traceability. And uh, last year, we spent a lot of time talking to the industry because we work at scale, as we've seen, and you know we're probably a, a, a good tool for um, retailers and brands to, to buy more sustainable cotton. Um, and so we asked um, almost 1,500 suppliers, so the actors that are processing the cotton from the, uh, the cotton bowl and you know, taking out the seed, the gin, and then spinning it into uh, yarn and uh, weaving it into uh, fibers, into fabric. Um, and basically, even in those groups that don't talk to the consumers directly, they said 84% across the entire supply chain have a business need to know where the cotton comes from. They need to know, or they anticipate that they'll be asked soon. So they really want to know. Um, and for um, the market, you know, everyone wants to know the origin right now and by 2030 everyone's going to want to know what is the exact esg impact so right now there's not that much ability to say meaningful things about um cotton at scale um you know cotton didn't necessarily participate in the early formulation of the lci methodology and so like it doesn't look great in the life cycles and included but it does eventually melt back into the ground so maybe it could be good um, and so we're working on this big project right now to make that possible. And I, I think that there's a whole other talk that we could have another day about why the cotton supply chain is very hard to trace. Um, but essentially, it's sort of going um, hand by hand with, um, you know, we work with maybe 12,000 actors that trade cotton um, in our current model and working with them to do something a little bit differently. So it would be possible to keep it separate. Um, but the idea is that doing that might create a way to benefit farmers. You know, you know, our mission is around um, improving farm level practice and making sure we have the resource to do that and that farmers can uh, benefit from their production. Uh, you know, all of the classical issues of agriculture where um, the rewards are captured by actors further down the, 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 the chain. Um, you know, are they with cotton too? Um, and I know that Alan Williams is going to talk a little bit about um, about Australia and beyond. Um, so I won't take up all of the space for talking about the farmers. Um, and I might um, leave it there, but I welcome any questions. And it's such an interesting topic to get into. Um, thank you, Alia. That was absolutely fascinating. I think which is exemplified by the kind of host of questions that we've got coming in for you. Um, so to start off with a kind of quick technical one, um, I don't know if you know what the variety of cotton seeds that the bet that better cotton is producing, or and also if you know um, who's supplying those seeds at all. 
Okay, so one of the things that for Better Cotton, because we're working at scale across so many contexts, we're trying to be neutral about the exact tools, just trying to support around more sustainable techniques, if that makes sense. So we don't sell seeds and we try to work with uh, local providers to ensure that there are good options available. But as I think I can see a few of the comments in the chat about um, there only being certain seeds available in, in India. Actually, that's a super interesting question in itself. I mean, there's plenty of farmers that work in our program that for their practices could be organic, but actually they, they don't have organic seeds. It's, it's, it's genetically modified seed because that's the only thing available. Um, uh, but, you know, it, like that, that, that is one thing to, to work on among the other millions of problems. Um, uh, there are a lot of people interested from a consumer perspective as well. Um, so interested to know how they can find out what brands are working with Better Cottons. And also if maybe you could say something a bit about the challenges of trying to get brands involved with working with Better Cotton as well. Yeah, you know, it, it, I, I mean, so I came from a background working with farmers. And so, you know, I've been in Better Cotton for four years now and the sustainability sector was, was new to me when I joined. Um, working with the industry in this way. And um, what really surprised me is how many of all the big global retailers and brands consider this important, whether they talk about it or they don't talk about it. And, you know, there's there are tons of them that have 100% sustainable sourcing targets um, and tons of them that support us. But then there's this other current that goes in a different direction where they say, ah, oh, you know, I think the numbers don't look good for cotton, for our risk mitigation, we'll just try to get rid of it if we can. Um, and, you know, like that, <laughs> that, that is an approach, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit, um, you know, someone, if you're working in a, in a for, in a, in a, like a purpose-based career, it just, it seems highly transactional. You know, if you want to make change, you've got to kind of commit to the long-term, um, you know, we're, we built this big program and we're operating at huge scale with tons of farmers, lots of cotton. And we've been investing a little bit at a time and all those farmers along the way. And in our next set, we're trying to go deeper. And it's, I think a question for us as to where is that drive to go deeper going to come from? It doesn't seem like our, um, our industry uh, colleagues are ready to, to pony up much more cash to make that possible. And so that's one of the reasons also we're trying to figure out how to, how to, um, build how to how to build that revenue stream ourselves, you know. And traceability is one of the ways we're thinking of doing that. That um, you know, over time we've been overseeing all these transactions. We have this system that that you know conducts the flow of our mass balance. And so we kind of know where all the cotton is more or less going. Um, mm -hmm. And by making a sort of supply chain traceability offering, that we can hopefully generate a lot more revenue that can be directed. So. We're, we're trying to win our way forward, essentially. I mean, it sounds 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 like a very good way of, of working towards that goal. Um, in terms of thinking about that goal, we've got a question that asks, if everyone did follow this kind of better cotton approach to growing cotton, how would it change that graph that Mark showed us? You know, would it be a kind of big change? Would cotton perhaps become more comparable? Mm. Um, or is, is it just a kind of small change? Is you know, do, do these changes have a have a the potential to kind of make up some yeah, of that gap? That's a great question. Um, you know, for our first ten, we've been around about ten years. For our first ten years, we've been we're kind of just trying to grow our scale and building our network. We work through partners all around the world, um, and. I mentioned, I don't know if you can tell that I felt a little bit sad about that particular graph because I'm like, you know, that's not totally true. Um, like the, um, you know, the life cycle is not taken into account. You know, all that polyester looks better than cotton and that's not true. You know, you know, you put it in your washing machine and it spits out microplastics that go into the ocean and into your food and it never um, goes back into the soil. I went to this, um, I mean, there's a few of these going around, like um, uh, so it was, someone was doing a talk called Soil Your Shorts. And it was about, you know, you bury a few pairs of underwear in good soil, bad soil, um, and you see in the good soil, the worms eat it in like, you know, like weeks. And in the bad soil, it takes longer. But like those plastic waistbands are there forever. Um, I mean, I think that in the, 
um, the next generation of the LCA, LCA methodology, it, it will look a little bit different, but we are also planning on making big changes, um, whatever means we can, because you can make changes. I mean, just like the things that in that video we showed. So, you know, that lady can make small changes. You reduce by 15% your inputs, you, um, you know, you conserve the water a little bit more and your profit grows because you've put less in, actually you've gotten more out because you're doing much more careful, um, time, like correctly timed interventions. Um, and so she's done better. So we've done that incremental stuff for a long time. And we have this target for GH genes. One of the things we're more advanced in measuring right now. We had this big study with, I think, 200,000 data sets. It basically looked like for our program up to 2020, um, for the countries we we're working with that incremental change, we're actually making a difference about 19% in GHG emissions. So it adds up. It does add up. You know, you have to, and if you don't try, you know, how, how are we gonna how are we gonna save the planet, right? Um, thank you, Anna. I think that's exactly the kind of tone we need. I know everything's been a bit bleak recently, so thank you. That was great. I think if we don't if we don't try, how are we gonna save the planet is um a great way to um to finish that. So I'm going to move on now to our third speaker um, of the evening, who is Alan Williams. So Alan, if you're ready for us, I'll call you up to the screen. Good evening or good morning from Australia. Uh, if we could have the first slide, please. I'd just like to uh, explain my background a little bit for everybody on the audience. Um, but while the slide's coming up, I appreciate the focus is on India for this uh, series of talks, but there is some shared heritage between the UK and Australia when it comes to, to cotton. There were cotton seeds on the first fleet of convicts that were transported to Australia in 1788. Uh, it took 170 years, though, for the modern, what we call the modern cotton industry to really uh, come online, and that was in the early 1960s. And I grew up on a cotton farm. So that's a photo of me on the left in my very, uh, probably first or second cotton farm that my father grew in Australia. And that's a photo of me with my three children on the last cotton crop we grew on that same farm uh, quite a few years ago now. Uh, I think it's important too to explain a little bit about the organization I work for, which is the Cotton Research and Development Corporation. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, it's based in Narrabri, which is in the middle of that uh, New South Wales there. And this map also shows the major cotton growing areas of Australia, which are all on the eastern side of the country. Uh, and about 80 to 90 percent of our cotton production is, is irrigated. Uh, but despite this reliance on irrigation, our production levels are very bearable. So two years ago in 2020, we produced about 130,000 metric tons of cotton of cotton lint. The season that we're currently harvesting, we're looking to produce 1.2 million tonnes of cotton lint. So we've had a nine-fold change in our production levels in just two years. So unsurprisingly, water is a very precious resource for our farmers, uh, and they continue to improve their water use efficiency, which is one of the major bars on the chart that Mark showed. However, the amount of water used to grow a bale of cotton, which is 227 kilos or 500 pounds, is now half what it was in the 1990s. And for Australian cotton farmers, they continue to improve their water use efficiency at a rate of about 2.5% every year. So the average grower today achieves a water use efficiency better than the top 1% of growers 20 years ago. And of course, much of that improvement has been driven by research funded by the Cotton Research and Development Corporation. It's a partnership between our federal government and our cotton growers, where each party pays $2.25 per bale of cotton uh, for research, for the benefit of both the cotton industry and the communities that they operate in, live in. And our job at CRDC is to identify those research needs and invest in the research to address them. And research into water use efficiency has long been a core activity of ours. So I'll now focus on data uh, with a focus on water use efficiency. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, and it, uh, it's a really good segue into the first of the points I want to make today. And one is, I guess, 
what I find frustrating as someone that's been in the cotton industry for a long time, whenever we talk about sustainability challenges in cotton, there's an overwhelming prevalence of fundamentally outdated data and claims that are continually being recycled on the internet. So if you look at that report on the right-hand side of your screen, Cotton, a case study in misinformation, that was published last year and spent about 130 pages going through all the misinformation problems associated with cotton. So I'm not going to go into detail, but I will note that I still see claims about cotton's environmental impact based on data from the 1990s and early 2000s. And I'm not saying there's no challenges, but if we're going to address the challenges, we need up-to-date information and the, the right starting point to proceed from. And to put that in per per perspective, Facebook launched in 2004, Twitter in 2006, the iPhone was launched in 2007, and Uber in 2009. So there are claims still being made about cotton that predate all those technologies, and I'm sure that any corporate strategy uh, that ignored any of those technologies would not be taken seriously. And I guess Mark probably unintentionally has illustrated my point. I understand that that study was from 2010. So the data in that study could be as old as the early 2000s, but certainly it's going to be earlier than 2010. Uh, as well as having data that's fundamentally out of date, certainly from an Australian cotton industry water use point of view, our water use has probably improved 25% at a minimum since that uh, study was published. As Alia mentioned, that, that life cycle assessment does not take into account the impacts of microfibers. So it's not painting a comprehensive picture of the impacts of those various fibers on the environment. So I guess my first take home message is really urge you to look behind any claims about cotton's water use and try and understand where the data came from, how old the data is, and not just for water use, but uh, for any impact associated with cotton. That's, of course, if you can find the uh, source of the information. One of the problems is, and this is another story, that uh, often there's no source for the claim. It, it's impossible to actually track down where the information came from. The, the second point I'd like to make about comparing uh, data, both between fibres, but more importantly, between different cotton production systems, as the next slide uh, I hope will show, is that um, I'm not a fan of those sorts of comparisons for, for a number of reasons. And really, as I think the speakers have already demonstrated this morning, this evening, cotton farming takes place under an enormously diverse range of conditions. So claims and comparisons along the lines of this T-shirt used X litres of water, even assuming that number is accurate, doesn't tell you anything about the local context that can affect water use and water sharing in that region. And so these include the temperature ranges, the cloud cover, the rainfall intensity, when that rain fell, depending on the time of the season of that crop. All those things influence insect pressure, weed pressure, disease pressure, and those things all combine to affect yield, the level of other crop inputs. There are factors that vary from region to region, between farms and even on the same farm. These include, and in particular, soil type, soil fertility, nutrient levels, how much water soil can hold, the, the density of the soil and the slope of the field on which you're growing the crop. It also tells you nothing about how water is being managed in a particular region and what the best crops to grow are in that region. Because farmers have a range of crops they can choose to grow, and they choose to grow cotton for a range of reasons. It's actually a drought tolerant crop, so it does well, things get too hot. Uh, it generates a cash income, which is really important for uh, small farmers. It doesn't perish like food crops, so you can store it and transport it long distances, and it doesn't lose quality. And those things all make it an attractive option uh, for farmers. And none of that contextual information is available if you see advertising that says this T-shirt only used X, or uses X litres of water compared to another T-shirt that uses Y litres of water. And I think it's, it's also important to note that it's not a zero-sum game between you either have water to grow a crop, be it a cotton or something else, or you have drinking water. 
It's really about managing the available resource for both outcomes. And as already noted by uh, UK-based sustainability expert Simon Ferrigno, water is not actually used, it's borrowed. So the most important thing with cotton is, is there enough water for where we're trying to grow cotton? And then is that water that comes out of the cotton system clean and available for other uses? So and that's what uh, sorts of things that Ali was talking about that the Better Cotton Initiative is focused on. Uh, and I, I can't finish my presentation without rebutting the claim that you, you may see that cotton is a thirsty crop. It, it uses about the same amount of water per hectare as other summer grown crops, so it's definitely not thirsty by comparison. And it returns, uh, from an income point of view, generally more money per hectare than a lot of other options. So that's why farmers grow it, because it, it generates uh, a better income for them all going well. And as I've said, it evolved in desert conditions. So being drought tolerant, it's more likely to produce some sort of income if conditions get too hot or the, the rains don't fall. So uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll finish with a, a focus on the farmer as well. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in the next slide shows a photo that I took when I worked for the Better Cotton Initiative between 2006 and 2012. Comparisons don't offer much value. So if you say a, a cotton crop in Australia uses X litres or you, you use X litres per hectare, but it takes Y litres in India, apart from the variability in the, in the things that I've already highlighted, it doesn't help a farmer actually identify or improve their water use efficiency. You have to identify the specific components of the irrigation system where there might be opportunities to save water, and you have to investigate the technological options available that suit your farming system. And there's a whole range of things like soil type, water source, how far you are from the water source, water quality, labour uh, requirements, what other rotation crops you might grow. And as this slide, I hope, illustrates access to capital. So that's a, obviously a lady picking her cotton crop on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, that's a harvester used to harvest cotton in Australia. It, on my rough calculation, probably harvests cotton at 1,000 times the speed of hand picking cotton. And obviously, it's got a price tag that is fundamentally at a, a, a different level to what can be done at a smallholder farm, which might be two hectares. An Australian cotton farm can be anywhere between 200 hectares and 20,000 hectares. So in conclusion, I, I just urge you, and I'll say this to Mark as well, be very wary of claims, especially if they're being used to market products to compete with cotton. Uh, I would encourage you to try to understand the basis for the claim and how old that data is. As I highlight, I've highlighted, the Australian cotton industry has doubled its water productivity since the 1990s, i.e. when some of the claims that I still see being made about cotton's water use uh, on a per basis, uh, per, per unit basis, they're still being used. And what's more important to understand is to look at the local context as Alia has demonstrated and try and understand what sort of improvements are being made in that particular context and what sort of support structures are available or needed to help farmers improve their water use efficiency or their input, their use of pesticides, the use of fertiliser and all the uh, impacts associated with cotton farming because there's plenty of improvement has been made and, of course, there's always room for continual improvement. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alan. That was, again, absolutely fascinating. Um, I was really struck by the kind of depth of research that your organisation is involved in. And I was kind of wondering, are there comparable organisations elsewhere in the world? And are there a kind of opportunities for knowledge exchange between them? Just because, you know, you mentioned the importance of that local knowledge and those local conditions for kind of making improvements. Uh, there's, uh, in terms of similar to my organisation, the US has a similar organisation, uh, but most cotton countries have uh, specialised cotton research institutes, uh, including India, Pakistan, Brazil. There's a, there is a, a, a wide body of uh, specialist cotton research that most countries will have scientists 
that uh, undertake research, and there is a, an international association of cotton research associ uh, scientists. So, yes, the, and I guess as well, one of the opportunities that BCI provides is for that sharing of, of information. And I know the cotton Australian cotton industry has supported the sharing of information with Pakistani uh, cotton farmers and the support for the deployment of, of expertise in Pakistan, for example. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here about the um, cotton industry in Australia in terms of its scale. So how does the scale of the Australian cotton industry compare to um, other countries? Uh, we, a few ways of looking at that question. We are in a good year, which is uh, sometimes uh, a few and far between. We export all our cotton, so we don't have a domestic spinning industry. So in a good year, we're probably in the top three of exporters of cotton in the world, so a very large part of the export market. Uh, but in terms of global production, we are probably in the top 10 generally, maybe top five or six in a good year, but well below the big players, which are basically China, India, US, uh, Brazil, Pakistan. So they're the, the, the ones that are always in the top five. And then Central Asia is another big uh, uh, producer of cotton as well. well thank you. Um, and sort of following on from that, we've got a question about the price of cotton and Australian cotton. So um, is cotton priced fairly across the world? So would brands pay more to purchase from Australia than they would compared to a country such as India? Uh, so noting I'm not closely involved in marketing, so this is just a general uh, observation. Cotton is uh, initially priced on the on, on the what it's traded on the stock exchange or on the cotton exchange in the United States. So there's sort of like a, a global price that is established that sets the floor, and that then individual countries will have prices that uh, I guess uh, are governed by that, but will not be dictated by that. So. I, Certainly the price levels across different countries will reflect that international price, but the actual price offered to a farmer could vary on country by country to country significantly, depending on the, the structure and you know the transport costs and how the industry approaches things like ginning costs and other costs associated with growing cotton. So same but different, I guess, is my answer. <laughs> That's a very good answer. Um, I think on that note, I might be nice to kind of pull our other speakers back in, um, if that's possible, so we can before we sort of finish up for the evening. So we've had some really great discussions throughout these three papers, um, particularly thinking about the different ways that we can think about cotton and the amount of sort of misinformation and disinformation that may be out there and the different types of data that you can use. So I kind of wanted to ask all of our speakers a little bit about why they think perhaps there is so much misinformation, so much selective information out there, and why is it so hard for kind of consumers to find out about that nuance? I mean, it's a great question. I think I was just mentioning to Mark in the, our, um, our chat that I was really grateful that he showed that slide actually because it's the information that's out there and people really do use it. They really do use it. And um, it's just one of those things. Like if you put something out there 10 years ago, finally that 10 years ago slide is the one people can find, they know about and you Google it, it's there, it's available. Um, and there's not much information about the nuance. Um, you know, it's, it's tough being a consumer. It's, I mean, it's even tough being a retailer and brand. So you'd think that the retailers and brands would know better or dig deeper or think harder, you know, cause it, but, and some of them do, actually many of them do. I should give credit where it's due, but plenty also think that must be the number because someone published it once and move on with that being the calculation. Uh, and I, I'd agree, Ali, and I, in, in some ways, I, I, I use that that chart as a bit of a red rag in, in some ways. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we have in terms of misinformation about cotton is um, how diverse cotton is. And I think that the fact that many people don't really know where cotton comes from. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, th there's politicians in the UK that we should who talk about we should be making, you know, clothes in the UK like we used to do without recognising the fact you just cannot grow cotton in the UK. And we have this um, 
historic uh, uh, industry that's built up over 300 years, if not more. And, you know, Alan touched on this for Australia, you know, how long ago cotton seed was taken over to Australia. So we've got this very, very complex industry that's built up over, over hundreds of years that has all sorts of um, connections that are, are, are cultural and, and, and social, as well as all about the individual, the farmer and their, and their families. And, you know, I spent time going out to look at farms some years ago, and you can have a farmer um, on one side of the fence producing cotton in a very different way to the other side of the fence in terms of the best practices that they have. And it was really intriguing, uh, actually. There was a question asked about, you know, does BCI, you know, have an impact? Um, and one of those projects I went to, they, they demonstrated an 80% reduction in water use and a similar reduction in the amount of chemicals that were being used on that on, on that farm compared to a farm literally around the corner. So that diversity that we see in terms of farming practices, that diversity we see in terms of um, agricultural systems and climate and, and irrigation and rainfall, all of those things add up. And it's one of those things that, you know, it's statistics and damn lies, isn't it? You know, this idea that when you add it all up and try and get an average, what you end up with is a number that means nothing. Um, but actually, it's much worse than that. I'm sure Alan will touch on this as well, you know, when he answers this. Is, there's a, millions of farmers, but we only have data points for one or two of those. And only those data points for a particular year. Um, and it's not what's going on now. Um, and, and Ali's absolutely right, you know, it's really hard for, for consumers. Uh, surprisingly, it's really hard for the retailers as well to, to know what, what's going on in terms of their supply chain. No, I no, just, yeah, confirm that, Mark. Data collection, you know, it, it's challenging in Australian conditions, whether we've got 1,500 farmers to get really good, accurate information. So let alone the challenge of India where you've got you know, upwards of, nine million farmers or Pakistan with us three million farmers. So there, there is a, a challenge with getting good quality data. But I, I think it's it's this as a, a technical person or a, someone with a science background, I'm, I'm trying not to just blame the marketers, but uh, I, I think it's about distilling things that are really complex. So there's probably half a dozen ways you can measure water use efficiency at least. But uh, People in the industry always takes time to get their head around that. So if you're trying to sell a product, then you're not interested in trying to explain to people the intricacies of how water use is calculated. You want a nice, simple message that resonates with your brand and with your consumers. Uh, and so there's, I think there's a mismatch, mismatch between the reality on the ground and the understanding of, of people. And then so people don't dig down into to wanting to understand it because it, there's no need to. And then you've got the added problem that that chart Mark showed, there's 15 different impacts uh, if you look at the life cycle assessment approach associated with potentially with cotton. So how can you, you know, water use has got half a dozen ways of measuring it. And that's just one of 15 impacts. So how do you distill dozens, literally more than a dozen impacts into some clear message? It, it, there is a fundamental challenge of information, uh, understanding and complexity in that as well. Um, thank you all so much. I think that sort of brings us to a close for this evening. Um, I think, I mean, there's lots of really big takeaways from me from this, but one of the biggest takeaways, I think, is the fact that often when I hear sustainability talked about in terms of um, the fashion industry, we sort of have uh, people pitted against the environment. And I think it's been incredibly informative to hear that actually that is not the case, that it's about working with both people and the environment um, and that people need to be part of this um, challenge as well. So thank you all very much for said really informative talks um, and some uh, really some, some things to take away um, to think about. So I just want to thank again our fantastic speakers, uh, Mark, Alia and Alan. Um, thank you all very much. And thank you, Alan, for getting up so early. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank you for joining us from home and sending in your questions to our speakers. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed tonight's event. Uh, and if you did, please do let us know by tweeting us at, at uh, sorry, I'm going to try that again. Let us know by tweeting us at, at 
uni leads engage and using the hashtag be curious late. And I think those are coming up on the screen. Um, we'd also really value uh, your feedback on tonight's event. So please let us know what you thought by filling in the short evaluation form that's available at the link which we'll share in the chat. Um, and those of you who booked the session will also receive an email with a link to the evaluation form tomorrow. Finally, if you enjoyed tonight, why not join us for our next Be Curious Lates event, which is on Wednesday the 13th of July, and that will be the final session for this series on cotton, and we'll be considering what comes next for the future of cotton. So you can register for your free tickets now via the link in the chat. Um, but that's it from us now, so have a great evening everyone, and thank you very much for joining us.